Hey, it's Medicosis Perfectionals, where medicine just makes perfect sense. Today we have a pharmacology mnemonic about phenol PAM. So let's get started. We divide hypertension into primary hypertension and secondary hypertension. Primary hypertension is idiopathic, which is a word of two parts. Idio means we are idiots and we cannot figure out the pathology. Idiopathic means there is an unknown cause. Secondary hypertension, however, it's secondary to something else. Therefore, there is a known cause. This cause could be Cushing disease, Kahn's disease, which is primary hyperaldosteronism, pheochromocytoma, renal disease, or coarctation of the aorta. Quick question. When you have coarctation of the aorta, what do you see on chest x-ray regarding the ribs? Yep, rib notching. You see those tiny notches in your beautiful rib. Question. Is the notching on the upper surface or the lower surface of the rib it's on the inferior surface of the rib why because this is where you normally find the neurovascular bundle so the vessels are already running on the inferior surface of the rib that's why when you get coarctation of the aorta the notching are going to be on the lower surface of the rib medicine makes so much sense once you understand what the flip you're talking about back to primary hypertension which is idiopathic unknown cause by the way this is the majority of cases most of the cases of hypertension we do not know the cause so secondary hypertension is less common however we love it because it's very easy to treat you just diagnose the underlying cause treat it so remove the cushing remove the cons remove the fail and boom you're done so how do how can you prescribe drugs for primary hypertension when you cannot know the root cause of the disease so let me give you a very simplistic example. Let's say that you work in a car shop. So your job is to fix the body of the cars when they get damaged in an accident. Does it matter if this car was hit by another car or by a truck or by a tree or by whatever? It doesn't matter that much. Like your job is to treat the dead gum car. If you can fix it, well done. Knowing the underlying cause of the problem is cool, but it doesn't matter that much. In many situations in other words I'm less interested with theories I'm more interested in treating flesh and blood human beings we know that when your blood pressure is high it's bad for you our job is to lower your blood pressure so how can you manage hypertension we have primary hypertension and secondary hypertension. secondary you just treat the underlying cause you remove the dead gum pheochromocytome regarding the primary hypertension we have lifestyle modifications and then when it fails we go to medications lifestyle modifications you decrease the weight you decrease sodium intake this is part of the dash diet and you decrease saturated fat intake also part of the dash diet so the dash diet most people know the dash diet as just low salt uh -uh, not true it's low salt, low saturated fat, and high in fruits and vegetables, etc., etc. Also, you increase your aerobic exercise. By every 10 kilograms of weight you lose, your systolic blood pressure will decrease by about 5 to 20 millimeters mercury. The way I remember it is for every 1 kilogram of body weight you lose, your systolic blood pressure could drop by 2 millimeters of mercury, which is cool. In a perfect world, the doctor will just say to the patient, please stop smoking, and the patient will just stop smoking because it's bad for him. That's like in La La Land, but in real life, very few patients will actually follow the guidelines and lose weight and lower their blood pressure by lifestyle modifications only. And unfortunately, most people will need medications. And this is just sad. So what is the purpose of antihypertensive medications? Um, to decrease the blood pressure. Oh, you don't say. That's brilliant. I couldn't imagine my life without you. So how do we lower the blood pressure? Remember the equation in good old physiology. Mean systemic arterial blood pressure equals the cardiac output times the systemic vascular resistance. And the cardiac output happens to equal the heart rate times the stroke volume. So if you would like to lower the blood pressure, you either lower the systemic vascular resistance or you lower the stroke volume or you lower the heart rate. Bingo. We're done here. So you either lower the cardiac output, you lower the systemic vascular resistance or the total peripheral resistance, which is the afterload. Because if this is your beautiful heart, afterload is on the arterial side. You decrease the resistance that's faced by your aorta decrease the preload is to decrease the resistance faced by your venous system superior and inferior vena cava and you do this usually by diuretics because diuretics will lower your blood volume and this will lower your venous return which will lower your stroke volume 
and when you lower your stroke volume, you lower your cardiac output, which will lower your blood pressure. Boom! And then, remember that total peripheral resistance or the systemic vascular resistance is inversely proportional to the radius. Not just the radius, the radius to the fourth power. So, let's say you dilate your vessel successfully by, let's say, 1x. This will lead to a decrease in your systemic vascular resistance by 4x. That's unbelievably good, because when you decrease your systemic vascular resistance, this will decrease your blood pressure. Mission accomplished. So here are the antihypertensive medications. We have the sympatholytics, direct vasodilators, calcium channel blockers, and renin angiotensin aldosterone modulators. What are the sympatholytics? We have centrally acting and peripherally acting. Centrally acting are alpha-2 agonists, such as clonidine and alpha-methyldopa, and VMAT inhibitors, which is reserpine. Peripherally acting include a false neurotransmitter, Mr. Fake guanithidine, alpha-1 antagonists, prazosin, terazosin, doxazosin, tamsulosin, etc., beta blockers, the indenolol, and D1 agonists, the famous phenaldopam, which is the topic of today's video. Now, before you talk about any D1 agonist, let's talk about what the flip is D1. This is a dopamine receptor number one. What does it do? Vasodilation. If you remember my discussion about beta 1 and beta 2 receptor, we did that in the pulmonology playlist. We talked about the lungs and we talked about beta 2 because beta 2 led to bronchodilation. Same thing here, beta 2 will lead to also vasodilation. How does it work? GS coupled. If you are GS, you will stimulate adenylate cyclase. This will convert the ATP to cyclic AMP. This will lead to protein kinase A. And then protein kinase A will lead to two things. If you happen to be a beta 1, this will lead to increased calcium in the heart, which will increase myocardial contractility. And then if you are beta 2, you will inhibit myosin light chain kinase. This will lead to bronchodilation or vasodilation. Since we are talking about blood pressure today, we are more focused on vasodilation. So the purpose of D1 receptor agonism is to dilate your vessel. When you dilate your vessel, you increase the radius, which will decrease the systemic vascular resistance, and this will decrease your blood pressure. Very well done. If you'd like to know more about dopamine, please check out my video on dopamine on my beautiful YouTube channel. Thank you, YouTube. And here is the lovely mnemonic, phenoldopam, you write it like this. What is fen? Fen means like a fan. What is 1 and D? This is the D1. What is dopam? This is dopamine. Ooh, that's great. So the mechanism of action of phenoldopam is selective D1 partial receptor agonist. It works only on D1. So let's say that this beautiful blood vessel has a receptor, and this receptor is called D1. When this phenoldopam binds to the D1 receptor, this will lead to vasodilation. What is the exact mechanism of action? It's through increasing cyclic AMP in the smooth muscles of the vessel wall. Great. This will lead to what? Vasodilation, lowering the systemic vascular resistance, and therefore the blood pressure. So phenoldopam, I'm a fan of D1 receptor. By fan, we mean agonist. Technically, he is a partial agonist. So please let me know down below in the comment, what does a partial agonist mean? What are the clinical uses of phenoldopam? Hypertensive crisis, which could be hypertensive urgency or emergency. We can also use it in post-operative hypertension. In other words, it's not for your outpatient care. It's only for inpatient care. This is for the serious stuff, man. These are the drugs that are used in hypertensive urgency or emergency. As you know, phenyldopam is here. It's a dopamine agonist work on D1 receptor. This discussion was just one topic of my cardiac pharmacology course. You can check this course out on medicosisperfectionalist.com. It has 50 videos on cardiac pharmacology, plus 25 cases, plus 25 questions with answers, of course, plus some notes to print and a mind map. These are the side effects of niacin, but that's another topic for another day. If you want to get a discount for my cardiac pharmacology course, use the promo code CARDIOFARM50 at checkout to get 50% discount. This is for 24 students only, and the CARDIOFARM25 is for another 35 students if you did not catch this one. These promo codes expire on this date. For the lovely people who purchased my cardiac pharmacology course, you have no idea how happy I was yesterday. Thank you so much for supporting my channel. 
I love you guys. Please subscribe and join the tribe to get exclusive posts. You can click on the join button next to the subscribe button. Follow me on all of these platforms. You can support this channel on Patreon or PayPal. If you have any questions, send me an email. And here is my lovely website to get my cardiac pharmacology course or my antibiotics course. Thank you so much for watching. As always, be safe, stay happy and study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionellos, where medicine makes perfect sense.